in my classrooms, I normally just use a chalkboard, so this is very multimedia for me. Okay, so uh, Joseph has been great and really helped me out a lot, and Cheryl's helped me out as well, so I want to thank them right away. Um, yeah, I figured that the real title of the project is uh, Speculative Satire versus the Neoliberal Hegemon, but I figured Certain Doom along with a subsidized lunch would bring more people in, okay? So that's, that's why we have that title there. First, I'd like to just thank uh, Denison uh, for the support in working on this project. In 2017, I received uh, the first round of Doan faculty fellowships. I was fortunate to, to get one of those. So I got a semester of, of, of research to uh, start this project. And uh, I've just recently uh, finished it to the point where I have a complete book manuscript and I'm, I'm shopping that around and keeping my fingers crossed. So that, that's where we are here. Uh, all I'd like to do today is just sketch out a general outline of my project, okay? Kind of give you the big picture, um, dive into a little bit of the couple of the big ideas, but I'm not going to do any deep dives into the complicated theories or, or, or any of that sort of stuff. I just want to sort of tell you what, what's going on and how, what the whole thing sort of looks like, okay? I will do one thing. I'll just read you like a, a page and a half of uh, the very opening of my introduction. Okay, um, And I'll just do that now. I said, this book operates according to the conviction that the economic and social ideologies today known as neoliberalism and neoconservatism are destructive and oppressive. To be clear then, I express in this study a distinct political point of view. This is not an objective analysis. Just as such texts never have a culturally specific unity, these of them are never carried out by perfectly detached scholars. Such an impartial critic is a chimera. What I offer instead is what all academics offer, an argument. Mine goes like this. Since roughly 1980, when neoliberal and neoconservative forces began their hostile takeover of Western and especially American and British culture, a type of sophisticated protest has emerged and developed alongside them within the sphere of popular culture that seeks to comment upon and even detour, deter those toxic doctrines. This type of protest is certainly not the only form of challenge popular entertainment levels against mounting neoliberal, neoconservative hegemony. In recent decades, there has been a proliferation of oppositional political satire available on cable and broadcast TV over new media, and in feature and documentary films. Such satire can take many forms. The kind of dissent I point out in this book, though, is distinct and identifiable. I call it the rant. The rant is grim, even in its humor, highly imaginative, and complex in its blending of genres. It, mix, it mixes facets of satire, science fiction, and monster tale to produce widely consumed spectacles designed to disturb and to provoke. Specifically, the machine. Simply put, the machine is the sum of the dangerous social, economic, and political orthodoxies spurred on by neoliberal and neoconservative polity. Such practices include free market capitalism, corporatism, militarism, religiosity, imperialism, racism, patriarchy, and so on. It is my contention that the rant seeks to gut punch audiences with an unmistakable warning against the machine. The warning is this, we are astray, it's only getting worse, change course now or suffer the which are likely to be calamitous. That is my argument in a nutshell. So happy stuff, okay, great, okay. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, first, and here comes the, the magic, okay, uh, walk you through uh, just my table of contents, okay, just briefly. Um, and I'll, I'll just walk you through it. I just read you a little bit of the, the introduction. Uh, the first chapter, I outlined the rant, uh, what that's all about, how it mixes together satire, science fiction, and monster tale. Lots of literary and, and cultural theorizing going on. In chapter two, I, I outline the machine in, in good detail um, and explain this idea of current day neo, neoliberal and neoconservative hegemony at work. And there's lots of 
economic and political explication going on there. And I think this is a little bit um, unique for studies of satire because it's very easy to say, oh, in satire you target folly and you target knavery, uh, that sort of thing. But um, I think the rent very specifically targets these things. And so I, I really closely looked at, at what kind of things are being brought out. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, detail here in a second about both the rant and the machine. Okay. In chapter three, um, I, I do some, some, some readings, uh, sort of fairly brief readings, concise readings of works that do rant against the machine. And you notice um, I, I use George Orwell's 1984, which is not technically a rant because uh, I'm talking about post-1980, but both that and Atlas Huxley's Brave New World certainly set the stage for for scientific dystopian uh, fiction, okay? And so I sort of compare Orwell's 1984 a little bit to Margaret Atwood's very famous uh, Handmaid's Tale from 1985, show their sort of similarities or how Atwood's sort of working out of that. Um, and then I do the same with uh, Huxley's Brave New World and Terry Gilliam's 1985 film Brazil, which if you haven't seen is an absolute hoot. It's a, it's a really excellent film. Um, and then I also take a quick look at V for Vendetta, which I think is a, a great film. Uh, believe it or not, Avatar is a rant, okay? Um, and then look at Neil Blomkamp's uh, film Elysium, which is a horrible movie, but a pretty good rant, okay? Uh, so, so, so it goes. So that's my first three chapters. Then what I do is I provide a brief sort of intermission and uh, coming attractions where I present what I call the rant playbook because there's a, there's a lot of stuff in the theories of the rant and the machine. And so I give the reader sort of, here's a big, here's a, a sort of a list of all the stuff I'm talking about. Okay? And certainly every rant does not attack every single thing, every single aspect of the machine. Uh, but I, I thought it'd just be good to, to give the reader a little break and, and, and sort of condense all of, all of that. Uh, and then I go into close readings, three chapters of close readings. In chapter four, um, I, it's called Living Under Lousy Orthodoxy, and I do a very close reading of, of two things. Um, uh, Jun uh, Ho Bong's film Snowpiercer, uh, which if you haven't seen, is a really bizarre film. I'm going to show at the end of this presentation. Um, only one picture for Parasite. So if you think... Weird. This is even weirder, okay, so. Uh, and then I look at Mark Atwood, the Mad Adam trilogy, uh, which I've been told is being turned into a series, uh, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so. Uh, and this is rants that sort of look at a, a specific aspect of the machine or a specific aspect of, of human dysfunction. Um, and so you'll see I look at uh, McCarthy's The Road as a, as a, a deep dive into post-apocalyptic and self-created doom. And if you haven't read that book, it's the most terrifying book you will ever read. I could not read it at night. It was just too scary. Okay, I had to read it in the daylight. Um, as an example of white supremacist racism, I look at Jordan Peele's Get Out, which is just a perfect movie. Um, then I, uh, as an example of militarism, I take an episode called Men Against Fire. Uh, and then as uh, an example of religious patriarchy, I look at an episode from the Hulu uh, Handmaid's Tale, which is also very good. Okay. Um, and then in chapter six, I, I take a look at what I just called neoliberal AI, artificial intelligence, because it's everywhere and it's, it's on our phones and it's watching us now and all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I look at uh, Dave Egger's uh, novel, The Circle, which again, like, Elysium is, is a bad novel, but a really good rant, I think. Uh, Spike Jones' film, Her. Ridley Scott's good old Blade Runner from 1982. Um, Alex Garland's Ex Machina, which if you haven't seen, is, a, is an amazing film, really, really thought-provoking. Uh, then I look at the, the Blade Runner 2049. Uh, and then finally, uh, take a little look at the Westworld series on, on HBO. And season three is coming soon, and it, it looks pretty... Pretty weird, and then I then I wrap it up with a with a conclusion. Okay, so that that's the big picture. That that's what I'm looking at uh, overall. Okay, um, then let me just briefly put up what I'm talking about with the machine here. Okay, um, 
And again, I won't go, I won't go into great detail on this, but the fundamental uh, principles of the machine are, are again neoliberalism, neoconservatism. Neither of these are monolithic ideologies. There's lots of different forms of neoliberalism, lots of different forms of neoconservatism, and neither do they necessarily go together, okay? Uh, but just in looking at what these rants were attacking since 1980 on, um, these are the two big things that they, that they keep targeting, okay? So by neoliberalism, basically the market over everything, that everything needs to be brought under the market forces and, and featuring possessive individualism, okay? Uh, which produces extreme wealth, equity, okay? The accumulation. By dispossession, money's flowing to the top because it's being sucked away from the, the middle and working class that kind of thing. Uh, corporations as unchecked private agent, uh, yeah, private agents, workplace abuse, okay. And then I found basically the three Ds, debt, derivatives, and individuation uh, seem to be a big feature of all this. Um, by debt, uh, basically a lot of people are thinking what we have now is, is a kind of a debt peonage system. Everyone is in debt and it's paying for that money going up to the top. And instead of uh, wage slavery, we have sort of debt slavery going on. By derivatives, it's the wild west of finance capitalism that keeps grinding away and those wonderful uh, in financial instruments that no one can understand that, that tanked us in 2008, you know, they're still, they're still out there doing their thing. And individuation is where we get chopped up into not individuals, but individuals, where big data can mine us to see what we're buying or preferences or how we vote or all of that sort of stuff. And recently, uh, um, an economist has, has come up with the notion of surveillance capitalism, that we're no longer even working. We're the stuff of capitalism. We're being bought and sold, and we, we don't even know it. So um, that's the economic side of the machine that, that's grinding away, producing catastrophe. Uh, Neoconservatism is uh, has these three main aspects: militarism, which is a perpetual foreign threat. So it used to be the Soviet Union; now it's an eternal perpetual war on terror, driving just rampant military spending. Okay, and that means you got to keep using the military in order to to keep keep spending on the military. And uh, we've become a very militaristic culture. Religiosity, uh, in the sense of fundamental fundamentalist Christianity, is. Uh, a big driver of a lot of aspects of the machine. And then this belief in, in primacy. Under the Bush-Cheney administration, it was the project for the new American century, which is morphed into America first, and it's basically American exceptionalism. We are, we are God's great country on earth, and everyone should worship us and do what we do, that sort of thing. So these are the, these are the aspects of the machine that the rant really objects to and, and targets. Again, in, sometimes in bits and pieces, sometimes certain aspects of these will be featured over others. Um, and that's, that's what the target is all about. Okay. Um, so let's move to the rant then. Okay. And um, it's, again, a combination of satire, science fiction, and monster tale. And I'll talk about uh, each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, you can see by satire, and satire is something I've worked on since grad school. I've been working on it a lot and, and in many different ways. Um, so what we're seeing is a bleak Menopean forewarning against a false orthodoxy. Okay, and I'll talk in a minute about what Menopean is. Um, but that's the primary aspect of, of this rant. Okay, the false orthodoxy is the orthodoxy of neoliberalism and neoconservatism. Okay, so this is, this is warning us against this. And I must say, a lot of people associate satire with humor, and that's not necessarily true, okay? A lot of satire can be hilarious and that sort of, but a lot of satire can be sort of humor, okay? And if you've ever read the Roman satirist Juvenal, uh, it's not a joyful event. It, it's, it's sort of that tragic chuckle, like, oh man, you know, he's, he's uh, bringing up a lot, of, a lot of sad truths, okay? And so uh, a lot of satire is, linked with, with philosophy and with tragedy, okay? And, and I, I think the rant can fall under this, although there are funny stuff that can happen. Um, and satire in general is a passionate argument exploring cultural issues of the day. That's why it's specific to a culture. Um, someone or something is blamed, and usually a satire will spend most of its time doing the blaming, okay? But equally, someone or something is praised, okay? Even in the grimmest satire, there's something there that's held up as a good example of, of behavior or conduct. Sometimes it's hard to find, but it, it's there, okay? Um, 
Satire as a, rhetor or a rhetorical tool really likes to use distortion and exaggeration. Okay? Um, the, narr the narrator or a narrative persona is often uh, a focal point, some, someone we can sort of a touchstone so we can uh, relate to them. That's a, a primary rhetorical tool as well. And what satire particularly likes to do is invade other genres. Okay? So you may think you're reading a scientific treatise and suddenly it's, you realize, well, Jonathan Swift wrote this and it's a modest proposal and you should not be eating Irish babies, you know, that sort of thing. So um, satire just loves to go fool us and, and suck us in by making us think it's something else, like, like a news program or whatever. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of the big picture of, of satire. Um, just to put detail on that, um, I, meant a, I mentioned Menippean satire, and this is from a Greek philosopher and, and cynic satirist uh, who lived in Syria uh, about 250 uh, BCE, named uh, Menippus, okay? And he was highly influential in the ancient world, uh, especially on a scholar and satirist named Varro, okay, who lived century BCE. And he was also very influential on Lucian, uh, who lived uh, first century uh, CE, okay, who was enormously popular and influential satirist and rhetorician who wrote in ancient Greek. And these, these three figures come up through uh, the medieval period up into the Renaissance and modern England, and are very influential. Okay? And so here are the key traits of Menippean satire. Uh, it's described as a genre for serious people who see serious trouble and want to do something about it. Okay. Uh, it tends to be written by dark satirists okay, who think the unthinkable, write the unthinkable with compelling concepts and languages, and thereby help us to read and understand the unthinkable. Okay. The attitude and the purpose of Menippean satire is more fundamental than any sort of readily identifiable uh, features uh, or, or structural ingredients. Okay. Um, but as I said before, the key elements of the Manipean satire in the rant is it is a bleak forewarning, okay? And it can be extremely bleak, okay? It tends to feature fantastical settings, situations, and characters, uh, especially outlandish voyages to strange lands, um, and it's often dystopian in nature, okay? Uh, so, and it takes the general form of a longer narrative, okay? So these are... Uh, for, for our purposes, they're, they're novels, uh, such as the Mad Adam trilogy, a feature film, such as District 9, or any of the ones I've mentioned, a multi-episode series, such as Westworld. Um, the, the technology we have today for, for video and TV and movies, it, it really lends itself to this form, okay? Because you can, you can invent, and with CG, you can concoct all sorts of great stuff. Um, and so it, it boils down to a postmodern critique of the modern state, okay? and the false orthodoxies that are, that are driving that modern state. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's, let's do this fancy stuff. Okay, so let's move to the second sort of genre mixed in, uh, science fiction, okay? And as it says up here, I'll explain some of these in more detail. Um, science fiction tends to operate on what uh, critics call a novum, which means a strange newness, and this strange nudist, science fiction, uh, you know, confronts us with something strange and weird and new, uh, and that produces cognitive estrangement. It's like, you, at first, you don't know where you are, you don't know what's going on, okay? But that cognitive estrangement then triggers what's called a cognition effect. In other words, you see this strange newness is like, you realize, oh, this is really talking about us. This is our world, and this is our society and culture. And we start to re-examine our own social order by way of this weird newness that we're, we're confronted with. And so utopia, dystopia is a frequent rhetorical tool uh, of this, and it showcases social issues. And sci-fi from the beginning is really, uh, modern science fiction, really pushed sort of Marxist issues, uh, feminist and gender issues, and race and post-colonial issues. It really lends itself to that, okay. Um, to, flesh out this a little bit. Um, what I found really, really interesting, I wasn't really expecting, is uh, the similarity of history and disposition of satire, modern satire, and modern science fiction. Okay, they, they, 
if you think about it, they are so similar, what they do, okay? Like satire, sci-fi is difficult to define. And I read tons of stuff where they were trying to define it, and it just, nothing quite clicks. Like satire, sci-fi has various roots and histories in Western culture, okay? Prototypes of sci-fi, a lot of people think, exist in ancient Greek and Roman uh, worlds, such as Greek myths and epics. If you think about it, they're kind of science fiction-y. There's lots of fantastic voyages, such as Lucian, who I mentioned before, uh, wrote a, a couple of them. One's called A True Story, and it's not true at all. Fantastic voyage. Another one is called, uh, and it's a story about Icarus, but it's a Menippean story about Icarus. Okay, so they here have. And again, like uh, satire, sci-fi has its most uh, vital developments uh, from the 16th century onward. Okay? Modern science fiction really begins in the Renaissance and the Baroque eras, such as Thomas More's Utopia, uh, Rabelais' uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel, Cyrano de Bergerac's Journey to the Moon, and Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Okay? That's, a science, that's a science fiction work, okay? but also it's a famous satiric work. Okay? Uh, all of these works are also satirical, they all feature fanciful adventure narratives with Menippean roots, uh, and the incredible journey seems to be a very, very much a piece with both satire and science fiction. So these two forms clearly cross paths as cultural developments of the rising modern state. Okay? They are fictional ways to process and inspect uh, shifting social realities, such as capitalism replacing feudalism. Okay, republicanism replacing aristocracy, science replacing magic, and challenging religious faith. Okay. Uh, and uh, they both occur and rise at the time of aggressive European colonization around the world. And so both modern satire and modern science fiction are sort of forged in the blast furnaces of capitalism, scientific revolution, enlightenment, industrial revolution, and empire. Okay. Um, so, like satire, sci-fi sci is, is regularly a deconstructionist pursuit. It, it critiques the here and now by having us imagine different places and different societies and al an altered reality. And like, sat uh, like satire, science fiction often gives voice to non-hegemonic people and points of view. Okay. Um, and some of the key elements of sci-fi here are, as I mentioned, the novum, okay, the strange newness. And this is a term uh, by the leading, the leading uh, scholar in, in science fiction theory who has the best name ever, Darko Suvin. Okay? So if, 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 if you want to be a leading critic in sci-fi, Darko Suvin is a way to go. Okay? Um, he theorizes the strange newness. Okay? And he says, although sci-fi creates and depicts other possible worlds, no matter how extraordinary they are, those other worlds seem to us, in, in the end, that reflect our own world, okay? And if they don't, then we're not dealing with science fiction, we're dealing with fantasy, okay? Which just takes us to other weird places and doesn't have a strong connection with our own. But science fiction, no matter how weird it is, at some point you wake up to the fact that it's talking about us, okay? Thereby, these works sort of strip away the naturalization process of ideology and myth and convention. If we can go someplace that's really weird, and then say, oh, well, that's us. Then we start to realize we're, we're pretty weird, okay? Um, so by having the familiar made unfamiliar, we're given the chance to recognize how our own society is constructed uh, and how our own social order is constructed and not necessarily true. So science fiction gives us something strange to contemplate so that we can understand how strange we are, okay? So it takes us to strangeness and then the strangeness comes back upon us. Uh, so the initial disorientation or alienation of satire uh, gets us to rethink uh, current reality. Okay. Um, and uh, as far as science fiction go, there, there's kind of two broad types. There's what might be called hard science fiction, which is just all about the science. Okay. Uh, and then there's something called soft science fiction or sociological science fiction. And that's, that's the, the branch I'm interested in. And most recently, that's come to be called speculative fiction, okay? And that's what, say, Margaret Atwood really specializes in. Um, so that, that's the branch of satire that, that I'm looking at, uh, science fiction, the speculative fiction. And what I am theorizing that since 1980, in the form of these rants, 
uh, satire and science fiction have united to become speculative satire. Okay, copyright. There we go. So, uh, so that's that's what I'm I'm really looking at and pointing out. Okay, so these are Menippean polemics against dangerous false orthodoxies that trigger the cognitive estrangement of sci science fiction. Okay, you see how they blend. Uh, the exaggeration of satire makes the familiar unfamiliar and then refamiliarizes us with it. Okay. Uh, the cognition effect comes from the blame and praise of satire. And so it triggers a, a deeper understanding of our social moment. Um, yeah, and both modes invent uh, amazing and, and particular narratives that uh, expose, uh, expose uh, culture as something that, that's made up and constructed, usually by the powerful. Okay. So I just started asking myself, is satire invading the genre of, of science fiction? Or is science fiction, in fact, a type of satire? And it got to the point where I don't, I don't know, and I don't know if it really matters, OK? They, they really tend to work together. Okay. Um, OK, so that's science fiction. And finally, um, a monster tale, OK? Um, Monsters, they're frequently in satire, okay? Or humans can be monsterized. And monsters are ubiquitous in science fiction. I mean, any alien, you know, any, any, any lab experiment, you know, it's all, it's all dealing with monsters. So monsters are basically weird creatures and strange things that disrupt the categories of normal. Uh, that we have. There are things that just don't fit. You know, our, our world's nice, neat binaries of this and that. And they don't fit into any of these binaries. They're just strange things. They tend to uh, sort of patrol the border of, of social constraints, but they also cross the borders and sort of entice us to cross the borders with them. Um, basically, monster theory, uh, as, as theorized by a guy named Cohen, uh, says you can tell a lot by a society by reading its monsters. What sort of monsters does it create? That's going to tell you a lot about what are the fears and anxieties of that society. Okay, So basically, bringing in uh, monster theory to this works rather well. So very often, social others are monsterized. Okay? Um, you know, the, the, the showing the bigotry and the raw workings of power. Okay. Uh, and very often in these tales, the human monster binary will be flipped, where uh, someone that we think is, is, is all human, usually the, the power elite, by the end of the story, you're seeing that who they have monsterized are really quite, quite nice creatures, uh, and they themselves are the monsters. Okay? So all these rants don't necessarily have to have strange creatures in them. Humans can very easily be monsters and, and behave monstrously in this way. Okay? Uh, so... Yeah, their uh, monsters are symbols created by specific societies, and then we're able to read the society through them. Okay. Um, and like like satire and science fiction, they are disrupting normal. And they by disrupting normal, we see that our normal is not necessarily normal at all. 